Well, June 4th was a watershed, uh, I think, in Chinese-American relations, first of all. And I think also it was a very important turning point in China's evol evolution. I say in the American-Chinese relationship because up until that time, through the 80s, things had been moving on a very steady track upwards. And uh, I think we didn't really read the signs very well of the uh, turmoil that was coming. But when I got there in about, what, three weeks before, four weeks before it happened, you could tell that something was going to go very wrong. And uh, it did go wrong, and then, of course, we had a very major downturn in our relations with China. We imposed sanctions, we cut off military contacts, we uh, suspended international financial institution loans, uh, we supposedly stopped all high-level contacts. Uh, so, and we took many years to work ourselves out of it because it became a real issue in American domestic politics. And then, of course, this fed into China, and China reacted to it and got very defensive and very angry about it and then struck back, and you had sort of a bad time. Of, and I don't think we've really fully recovered yet. The atmosphere is still there. You see it keep coming up, and it's tied in with Chinese human rights record and uh, whether we should give them permanent most favored nation and how much we should, we should support their entry into World Trade Organization, whether this is linked to... That all is derivative from Tiananmen. It hasn't gone away here. The Chinese, of course, say it's over, but I can see how nervous they are about Tiananmen and about Hu Yaobang's birthplace, and they're very sensitive to it, too. They know it hasn't gone away either. Okay, sorry. Can you tell us a bit more about the miscalculation uh, as far as assessing June 4th in 1989? Well, I would say there were probably two miscalculations. First is, I think the Chinese miscalculated. They didn't realize that when they used the armed forces to suppress the Tiananmen demonstrators that it would have this kind of a worldwide effect. They didn't realize the impact of the communications revolution, and I think it really surprised them. And they couldn't say the things they've said in the past about domestic turmoil and sort of dismiss it and give their own version. Everybody saw the version, and their version didn't coincide with the facts, and that hurt them, I think. That was one miscalculation. China did not calculate the impact this would have on the world. I think the United States probably miscalculated in the sense that we thought, at least originally, that China was a strategic partner against the Soviet Union and that this was really the important thing of Gorbachev's visit to China. We were meeting Deng Xiaoping and reestablishing party relations and we were all nervous about that and we sent the Seventh Fleet into Shanghai and it was, a, it was the great power game. Well, as it turned out, that had nothing to do with it. And I told the Chinese at the time and that, look, watch out, because uh, it, the media is going to get you on this thing. And uh, we also got the Seventh Fleet out of Shanghai very quickly. It was no bonanza for us. It, was, it looked like something terrible was going to happen, and we didn't want the American military there running up to Peking and toasting the Chinese. So I think we miscalculated in that sense. Uh, Who did you talk to in the Chinese leadership when you said you were giving a well, bit of advice? We talked to the mayor of Shanghai, and we talked to the... Uh, see, Jiang Zemin was still in Shanghai then, and Zhu Rongji was the mayor, actually. Jiang was the party secretary. And, but we talked to the, the, uh, the re residual resident military commander, Admiral Ma, of the, uh, of the uh, EC fleet. And he understood. He, 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 he didn't think we should go to Beijing either. The, the Shanghai streets were full of demonstrators, and Beijing was worse. So, I mean, there was no time to bring the military to Beijing. So we got him out of town. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you weren't in Beijing when the massacre took place. I sure was. Were we? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess I'm misinformed. Um, when you first heard about it, I mean, how did you, how did you first hear about it? Where were you? What, what were you doing? I was in the embassy in Beijing at, at, uh, in uh, Jianggongwai, and uh, we 
saw the tracers. We had watchers down on the uh, the uh, western side uh, watching the tanks as they came in, and we reported on the gunfire. We right away the reports came in, and then we had people on the square, and we had people in the Beijing Hotel watching from that angle. We knew what was going on right away. So you expected, I mean, not expected, but. Uh, no, I think about 10 days before it happened, I wrote a telegram back home and said, it's going to happen. I thought it would happen probably over the Memorial Day weekend, but it happened about three days later. Mm -hmm. That the military would have to crack down. They, they couldn't tolerate this going on. Their own plain clothes were being turned down, turned back, and the, the goddess of liberty on the square, and the, the things that were happening. Dunn was an Old Testament man. He was going to take revenge. Do you think that the Be Beijing leadership was actually kind of cornered into a position where it, it, it couldn't do anything but react in that way? No. No, I don't think so. I think that they, uh, they turned to that because that was their, that was their instinct, to look to a, a massive crushing of the effort rather than to deal with it. They had tried other means, and they'd failed. But still, you could have handled it in ways that would have been much less damaging and much less uh, punishing for China. I mean, it was a miscalculation to do it as suddenly and with a massive intrusion of force, and then what they did afterwards. They could have handled it much better, I'm sure. Do you think the movement was a naive one in 1989? Well, I think many of the leaders were spontaneous, uh, opportunistic, uh, energetic, youthful idealism, seize the moment kind of psychology, and it, it just sort of a ripple effect that brought a group along. And there was a lot of stirring rhetoric and an appeal to the outside world and a sort of a Chinese morality play going on between the the old mandarins of the court of the Forbidden City and the uh, the young idealistic revolutionaries on the outside, like, the, let's say, the May 4th movement, 1919. Uh, except in this time, it, there was no real foreign involvement. Much as the Chinese would like to have blamed it on the foreigners, the foreigners weren't involved. The foreigners, uh, this was particularly a Chinese show. It was Chinese against Chinese. But the, 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 the authorities couldn't accept that. In the communist ideology, you cannot have the people rise against the party. That's impossible, unless you have reactionary foreign influences driving it. So it's a, it's a sort of a, a principle that they have to pursue. But the evidence of that simply was not there. I've been blamed for it, you know. The Chinese Dagong Bao in your, in your city has said that I came in, uh, I was uh, an old spy under stately diplomatic cover, and I organized that whole thing in three weeks. And I'm proud of it. I mean, I, I thought I was pretty good, but not that good. Okay. Now, uh, as far as uh, assessment, risk assessment and, and the movement, was there anybody in the movement that would have been a good leader? Well, I, I can see you're asking me a series of loaded questions. Uh, there, I there was nobody in the movement that could have taken over China, but there were people who supported the movement who could have run a better China if that's what you mean. I mean, the people that supported the movement, like Zhao Ziyang and uh, Yan Mingfu and uh, Bao Tong and others, Chen Yizhi, Yan Jiaqi, they were the brains. They were the people behind it, and they all got axed. Now, I don't think they really had a chance of winning right from the beginning. But I thought they showed a lot of courage in supporting the movement. And if, if, if somebody would, had, would have taken over, it would have been them. And they were experienced leaders. And I think still, I think Zhao Ziyang probably is one of the most popular men in China after 10 years of literally house arrest. And I, I, it seems to me that this was the, these were the losers. It wasn't Chai Ling or Wang Dan or Li Lu who would be the leaders. These guys would have been the leaders. They were challenging the leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that? Um a reassessment is, is really necessary for China to go forward? Well, I think as long as you don't have one, you're going to sort of end up with a chip on your shoulder. You're going to end up, as they say, with Chinese testy combativeness about things. 
you're going to be defensive. You're going to be almost paranoid. And uh, they did this before in 76. They cleared the air on it. And they reversed the verdicts on various political movements. Uh, it seems to me that this has to be recast. It has to be described in much more accurate terms. And uh, it, right now, it's, 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 it's ludicrous. It's a caricature of what happened. So it seems to me that they would want to get a more accurate version out on the table, how many people were actually killed, what was the motivation behind it, that these were decent people who perhaps reacted out of immaturity and, and uh, energy and commitment. They weren't evil counter-revolutionary criminals, not at all. Fang Li Jir is not a violent man. He's really, he doesn't like the system, but he's not violent. He's, he's a Gandhi type man. And th those people were not evil men. And I think it'd be very good to do what Taiwan has done in a way. Reach out to the old Taiwan independence crowd and bring them back in and give them honor and make them join the system. Work within the system rather than drive them out of it. And then you just have continuing suppression that goes on and on and on if you don't face up to it, it seems to me. So I, I think it would, be a, it would be probably in China's long-term interest if they did re-examine the verdict at Tiananmen. Do you think it's ever going to happen under Jiang Zemin's presidency? Probably not. I think you'll probably have to wait for the next generation. Why is that? Well, I think all of these, although Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji handled Shanghai much better than the people who were in Beijing handled Beijing, they didn't lose anybody. They talked them out of it. And they used some coercive methods too, but they, didn't, they, they weren't violent. They knew how to do it. But I think as long as you've got a lot of the old crowd that did it still there, it's going to be very hard. These guys are in top leadership positions. And, and they're in the military and they're in the party. So you, you've got to be a little careful on this one. You can't do it yet. You've got to wait it out a while. Do you think the issue of China's human rights record has been dwarfed by uh, other issues such as WTO? I think not dwarfed, but put into perspective. That certainly in Clinton's first term, you had an unreasonable emphasis on the human rights issue. You had it linked to trade in the most, I thought, idiotic way. And it was defeated, and he was humiliated and had to back down. Well, what they do when you have to back down is you keep shouting it in the wind, as the Chinese say, fang kong pao, you're firing empty cannons. And uh, they'll keep harping on it, but the Chinese don't take them seriously. They're not going to get anywhere in the UN Commission on Human Rights in Geneva. I don't think they're going to get a single European country voting with them. And, uh, but this, this pacifies Clinton's liberal domestic constituency. It's all about American domestic politics. And the Chinese know this. So, I mean, I would say human rights are obviously going to be part of our agenda from now till the end of time. But it's, it's now one of the major issues in our relationship with China, along with other equally important ones. Perhaps even more important, World Trade Organization, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, North Korea, environment, pollution, terrorism, crime. These are important, very important. You've got to work on them. Has, has, the, has the idea about protecting or trying to safeguard human rights in China, is it all just lip service now from Washington? Well, it isn't exactly that. You've got too many interest groups pushing it. It's got to be a little bit more than just talk. But the realization is that you are able to accomplish what you seek to accomplish in China much better by more effective and more subtle means, such as obviously, let's say, uh, advancing the rule of law and going from commercial to political civil issues, in expanding, let's say, village elections from village level to xian level, or increasing exchanges on, uh, let's say, historic issues. I mean, I think that it shows the gap when uh, the premier cites our civil war as an example of how they're going to manage Taiwan. I mean, you've got to be a little careful on that. The analogy didn't fit very well. 
And uh, I think that shows a certain gap, whereas the Chinese saw it in terms of the military dimension. Abraham Lincoln saw it more in the moral and democratic and human rights convention. And certainly I saw it as no example to be used to unify China because you'd lose 50 million people in terms of today's ratio. It doesn't make any sense. We're not recommending our way of handling reunification and civil war to you in China, not at all. It's the wrong way to do it. So is China's pursuit of, a un of unifi reunification with Taiwan um, a rudderless one? Is it naive? Is it no, no, I know. It's it not a naive at all. It's, it's, it's a major, a major part of their national strategy. It's, it's a very, I mean, the unity and sovereignty issues are ringing the bell in China. It's, it's getting people behind you. Uh, I think it's, it's very important for, for the Chinese leadership to stress this issue. It's part of their whole structure of, of control. And uh, the problem is, is there, there are two ways of approaching it. There's one is you attract Taiwan and cultivate them and bring them to you as a friend and as an honorable partner. And the other is to try to threaten them into it. And I think so far there's been probably a little more on the threatening side, although back in 87 I think it was more on the other side. But recently it's become drummed up by demagogues and that sort of into some kind of a uh, nationalistic issue. And I think that's really very dangerous. Mm -hmm. You end up like the Bosnian Serbs or it's not good. It's not good. It can be handled other ways. You're doing great on economic, cultural, commercial, trade exchanges. Focus on that. 